In this climate of global uncertainty, the role and the influence of the risk profession, I would suggest, has never been more pronounced. So what then is the changing role and what are the new challenges the sector is facing? One person at the centre of this debate is Christopher Palm from the Institute of Risk Management and he joins us on another edition of Spotlight in association with the organisation. Chris, welcome to Spotlight. Thank you very much for joining us. The characteristics then of this frightening new global environment, you've looked at those. Yeah, Jeremy, good morning. Thank you for having me. We as IMSA have identified six key drivers in the global environment that we need to consider when thinking about the response of risk management in, in this change, in the changing times. First, being this exponential growth in data, the availability of data, we've seen it now in COVID-19, so many different sources, the credibility of the data that's provided, and what do you have to work with? So it's this influx of data that we need to consider. Secondly, is this whole drive towards technology, the fourth industrial revolution. How can we bring that and use the data in such a way that can give us foresight? The third element here is the changing customer. People are thinking differently about the products and services, not just about what they are, but how they deliver. Then we're looking at the obvious one, geopolitics. Thinking about world wars, there's been discussions and mm. there's been threats around those, trade wars, of course, and then pandemics. And then also, you know, terrorism and all of the things that historically we would have thought are um, just out there and they've all of a sudden through COVID-19 been brought onto the palette. I listened to that list that you've just outlined and I am utterly overwhelmed by it. Where does a risk manager start in terms of engagement? I think the important thing here is that risk management in itself is not going to be the solution. Risk management is an excellent tool, but to integrate with strategy, risk and resilience is the start. It's the new start for risk management going forward. That will give us foresight, it will give us an ability to leverage opportunity, it will give us the sense to manage the downside of risk, and you know nothing is perfect. So if something then does go wrong, we will be resilient enough, not just to survive, but to thrive in those times. How do you begin that process of integration? It's important that we look at leadership firstly. There was a very interesting discussion around the readiness of the UK and America in as far as a pandemic was concerned, and they rated tops. And as we see now, having spoken to the people that ran the survey, leadership came out as one of the things that they did not survey, they did not ask about who's in charge. And I think that's the starting point for risk management, is to get our leadership aligned to the understanding of risk management, risk aware, understanding the benefits of linking risk to strategy and resilience, and then to drive it. That astounds me when you say that, because it suggests that leaders are not doing that. Isn't that a principal pillar of leadership, that your job is to navigate through the risk environment. So where are they failing? And that, I presume this is in both the public and the private sector. Yes, yeah, of yeah. course. Across public and private sector, the idea that risk management is just a risk register is where we fail. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Risk is about the future. And so using scenarios, using development of alternative futures are elements that leadership are missing. And that's where the chief risk officer role, the leadership role in risk management needs to come to the fore now. Christopher, it's difficult to run scenarios uh, when you're dealing with the here and now, yeah. when there is so much uncertainty. How do you find that balance, I wonder? I think that's the point, and I think that's the downfall, is that we wait for here and now, and we're integrating strategy risk with resilience is about the future, it's about foresight. It's about taking the discussion into the future and not the here and now. And that's a very difficult thing to do. It does require a new type of leader. It does require a new type of business model. And it requires creativity and innovation. And all of that put together will give us the agility then to start having discussions that are future focused and that the discussions at board and oversight committee is about developing 
alternative futures and not the year and now. We're not just talking about board leadership here, though. We're talking about leadership that cascades right through the organization, aren't we? Of course. Yeah. Yes, indeed. That's the definition of resilience. The old operating model, and that was one of, that was the sixth characteristic of the new world, is that business models need to change. They need to become agile. They need to be able to turn on a dime. And so for that reason, you have to appoint accountability to where it belongs. It cannot be the old hierarchical, uh, vertically integrated structures that we're dealing with at the moment or that we're having. I'm assuming that there are organizations uh, that are getting this right. Or is this a conversation entirely driven by desperation? No, indeed. Uh, we've done a survey. Uh, we um, issue an annual risk report for the country. And part of that survey was listed companies on the JSE that provided insights into who uses risk management as a foresight tool. And although not many, we certainly do have those in South Africa. And APSA is a very good example of something like that. Um, in as far as um, there was this award, the Global COVID-19 um, Award, mm. which was awarded to APSA amongst six others in the world. And that's just testimony of how they knew about the risk, how they prepared for the risk, and how they thrived throughout this time. Yes, they do have their, their bumps and bruises, but certainly to have, to have won that award is indicative of companies in South Africa that have gotten this right. I'm just fascinated that you know, we're five or six months into this pandemic and already we're finding opportunities for awards around it, but that's the cynic in me. <laughs> um, what about communication in terms of risk management and making sure that uh, it is disseminated not only internally but also to your principal stakeholders? I mean, the, the, the tonality and the, the way in which messaging is constructed surely has changed. Yes, of course. And I think there's something very interesting that I need to highlight around the way that we talk about mm. risk. The time where risk is sugar-coated or the message is varnished, we speak about the unvarnished truth in risk management, and the time is right. Consequence management. Not holding. following you, so previously it was, uh, it was the register as you spoke about, yeah. and it was a box ticking exercise, and that uh, it was something that we hoped we didn't have to confront, but there was something there in case we needed to do so. Now you've got to face up to blunt reality. Yes, indeed. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, that's yeah. indeed. And added to that is the fact that, let's stick with a risk register example. We know who has to do what by when, but that's never been brought to accountability. So the whole idea about holding people accountable to manage the risks and the opportunities and then have consequence management attached to that is what needs to find its way into our reporting. Mm. Chris, I want to go right back, if we can, to the, the, the first of those six pillars. Um, and I'm going to combine data and new technology. Um, these days, it's about understanding, interpreting and using data. It would be my contention, having uh, been involved in this industry for quite some time now, that that is a weak point, that there's not enough understanding of that data. How do you get that right? I do agree with you. In as far as risk management is concerned, that's one of the gaps UMSA has identified. And we are collaborating with the universities, with other professional bodies, ASA for example, the Actuarial Society mm. of South Africa, to gain a better understanding of what the relationships are between data and information and then also to be able to upskill our membership and not just membership management everybody that's associated and you mentioned it earlier basic management tool is risk management and so for that reason to be able to upskill to understand what it means and then to in implement that within the risk management programs that we run in, in our organizations. And again, both public and private. So where's the, where's the jump off point for someone in the risk profession that is engaging with us today? Where do they start? Because unless you get that right, uh, you're not gonna win at this game at all. Yeah, well, most certainly- Someone will eat your lunch. Yeah. yeah, so most certainly, if you ask for the jump off point, that would be to become a member of IMSA, to understand um, the whole landscape of risk management and the way that we um, collaborate and the way that we talk about risk management and the thought leadership that's going behind this. And then also that I have to say is that the, 
there are so many new developments. There are so many entry and exit points, like we say, integrating with strategy and with resilience, talking about better decision making, and then what we've been talking about years, governance and risk and compliance. So there are so many, many different thoughts, different um, theories around this. And so if you ask for the jump off point, I would certainly recommend that you become a member of IMSA, at least use IMSA's website, come to IMSA's conference mm. and see this landscape and understand what it's all about and align your risk management program to that. We're coming to the end of this conversation. It's also about being courageous. It's about speaking out. It's about calling problems when you see them. Um, let's be unvarnished. We are living in a climate in South Africa of hyper-corruption. It's a problem. The president himself has called his own party accused number one. So we all acknowledge that it's a problem. Yeah. What role can your profession play in this dynamic? And are you engaging with government? Oh yeah, of course. So um, February, March, IMSA, well, let me first take you back to the discussion we had around the risk report. So IMSA develops a risk report for South Africa. It's called the IMSA South Africa Risk Report. The last one was issued in this year in February. Um, and in that report, we highlight what we believe the risks to South Africa are. And so in the beginning of this year, we wrote to the president, February, March, we wrote to the president on three things. We said, please here with attach, find the copy of our risk report and the three major risks that we've highlighted for South Africa over the last five years, we believe are going to hinder us from getting through COVID-19 unscathed, or as a matter of fact, at the time, we believe we were world class. Mm. We were leading this charge. And what were they? Firstly, ethical leadership. We said, we do not have ethical leaders in this country. And for that reason, the risk treatment that we would put in place would be subjected to pilfering. Fraud and corruption was the second one. We highlighted the risk around fraud and corruption. And not just the risk, the pervasiveness and the systemic nature of fraud and corruption. And also highlighting then to say that we are historically very poor at delivering against mega projects. We don't attract the right and assign the most um, appropriate resources mm. to making these projects successful. And so we wrote to the president and we asked for this to be risk-based in its nature. And so happy to say that sometime in his conversation, I don't know if it was April or May, I can't remember specifically, but the term risk-based decision-making then became part of his narrative, which is great. We also, as IMSA, in, in not just advising the countries as far as the risks are concerned and some of the risk treatments, we also collaborate and have a, um, a, a memorandum of understanding with the SIU. Andy Advocate Andy Matibi, mm. the um, Special Investigations Unit. And so what do we do as risk professionals? Talking about unvarnished truth, we get put in the firing line. And so for that reason, we've um, collaborated with the SIU uh, so that risk professionals can use their reporting lines should they feel that they're under pressure, that they are compromised or that they are asked to varnish the message that they give in their, in their risk message. Christopher Palm, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us. Just a reminder, the uh, annual IMSA conference in uh, digital form this year uh, with the theme setting or seeing a risk intelligence future is on the 30th of September and the 1st of October. Details are on your screen. And thank you for watching Spotlight.